thank you all for praying and i pray that you will continue to uplift god in all aspects of your life so i have entitled my sermon for tonight are you ready to face your life's records in the last in the book last day events i forgot the page number tomorrow i'll tell you velen white says not 1 in 20 how many not 1 in 20 whose names are registered in the church records are prepared to close their probation if you put that in ratio how many how much is that not 1 in 20 Yeah, out of 20 not even one means nothing almost lord have mercy on us just because your name is on the books of the church doesn't mean you are entitled for heaven just because you are baptized doesn't mean you are saved is it possible to be baptized and be still lost so what's the point there is something that is missing my dear boys and girls students and staff and whoever is here i'm sharing this with a burden sometimes i may sound harsh but with love i have no enemies here i don't even know who you are but i have a burden to see adventist church rise to the occasion of preparing ourselves to meet the lord how long shall we sit and enjoy the blessing of god and don't change a bit god is looking for transformation alanwar says the greatest need of the church is what revival godliness and godlikeness is the goal to be reached so please take your christianity serious your relationship with god serious so let's look at what is happening right now what are you ready to face your life's records when we think of that we think of judgment isn't it i want you to know judgment is a process it's not just an event it's not just one day it's happening and it's gone as adventists we believe judgment is a process judgment has three phases the first phase what we call pre advent judgment or investigative judgment we we no more use this word investigative in the adventist circles because it seems to suggest some negative aspect of work so the scholars try to discourage us using the word investigative so we use two types right now either we call it pre advent or judgment of the righteous now this phase of the judgment is what is actually happening in the most holy place right now what we call the blotting out of sins that's the first phase of judgment and what is the purpose of this judgment you think god is blind he doesn't know who is lost who is saved why does he have to do this judgment so what is the purpose the purpose of this judgment is it is the judgment of the righteous only those who have accepted christ as their savior this part of the judgment only their names would come it is the evaluation of the righteous it deals with determining who the righteous are and has the right to eternal life it takes place for the benefit of the unfallen heavenly beings the world is watching to see if god is just and merciful he has to he has to declare himself that he is just and at the same time he is merciful so the it is for not for the benefit of you not for the benefit of me but for the world around the unfallen world to see that what god allows into his kingdom is just and fair so this is for the benefit of the unfallen unfallen world the second part of the judgment is called millennial judgment or the judgment during thousand years it is the judgment of the wicked the first phase is the judgment of the righteous the second phase is the judgment of the wicked what is it it is the evaluation of the wicked why they are not saved among this wicked could be you and me and why the purpose of this judgment is for the benefit of the righteous i will share that uh, uh, um, uh, um, in the course of this week you know you and i could be in heaven and you you could be missing somebody who you love so dearly and you so that is the time that the clarity will come the third phase is called executive judgment or it is also known as the punishment of the wicked or the final eradication of sin and sinners what is it the purpose it is to convince the devil the evil angels and the wicked people that god is just 
and that they are wrong. It is the final eradication of sin from the planet Earth, which also I will share with you during the evenings in this week. So what is judgment? The simple definition is it is the investigation and declaration of your life in spiritual terms. Is judgment a good news or a bad news? Tonight I, I need your uh, responses. What do you think? It's a good news to those who believe and a bad news to those who reject Christ. So the, 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 the news depends on where you stand. Why judgment? Why God has to judge? Remember Daniel 7.22, it is in favor of God's people. God is judging to save you and me. We must understand that. It to demonstrate before the universe of God's created beings that he is just and fair. The devil has always been blaming that God is not just, he is not fair. So the judgment is going to declare to the entire universe. Tomorrow morning I'll show you some slides about the universe, how big it is and how good our God is. But I want you to know the whole universe is watching to see whether God is fair and just and that is to declare. To fulfill the hopes and yearnings of humanity. How many of us long to see Jesus come? Hopefully Friday night I'll share with you the second coming and are waiting for that blessed day to come. And this judgment is going to bring that event even closer. The judgment is not about who have sinned. Get this please. Why? Because all have sinned, isn't it? Is there anyone who is not a sinner here? We all have sinned. But so what is it? It is about who have accepted salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what is going to be dealt in the first phase of judgment. God is fair in the sense that he allows people to choose what you want. He is also completely fair when he holds people accountable for their choices. Don't think that because mercy prevails, you can escape. What is the purpose of judgment? Divine justice in this unjust world. Retribution for every wrong that is done. We have to pay the penalty. The suffering of the innocent will come to an end. The resolution of the conflict of good and evil will be put to an end. The end of sin and suffering to vindicate the creator, his character, law and governance is fair and just. Judgment is part of the eternal gospel. Do you know that? Judgment is a part of eternal gospel. Three angels message is about the gospel and the judgment. The question is, does the judgment jeopardize the salvation of those who believe in Jesus? What do you think? Can it jeopardize your salvation? Yes or no? The answer is no. If you are a child of God, walked in the light that God has given you, judgment is not going to affect you in any way. Then why pre-advent judgment? Why is this necessary? As we said, the judgment is not for the benefit of Godhead. God knows everything even before it came into existence. God knows you in and out even before you're born. He doesn't need a book to read and understand who you are and where you would be. So it is not for the benefit of the Godhead the judgment is being ta taking place. It is primarily for the benefit of what? The universe answering the charges of Satan and giving an assurance to the unfallen creation of that God will allow into his kingdom only those who truly have been converted. So it's benefit for the entire universe. There are three classes of people today. One is those who have accepted Jesus. The second is those who have rejected Christ. And the third is still to make a decision whether they want to follow Christ or not. I don't know in this congregation if there's anyone who has not yet given your life to Jesus. I believe we have baptisms this Sabbath. It is time that you give your life to Christ. When God speaks to your heart, do not delay. We, have, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. So if you are in the third category, not yet decided what to do. You know, many people don't want to give their heart to the Lord because they think, I'm a sinner. I need to give up this weakness. I need to overcome this temptation. Let me tell you, that day will never come. It is God who gives you the strength to overcome when you give your life to him. You cannot do it on your own strength. Give your life to Christ and see what changes he'll bring in you. That is the process of salvation. So there are some there. But before the close of probation and the end of the judgment, there will be only two classes. Either you're on the Lord's side or you're on the devil's side. When does the judgment take place? The Bible is clear, Revelation 14, 6. And it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Having what? An everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is what? 
is come. It's not it will come, it is come, which means it is happening right now. It is happening right now. As a prophetical students, maybe knowing the Bible, you know, when will the judgment begin? Daniel 8.14 says, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary be cleansed. And if you are a prophetic student, you have gone through some prophecies, we believe it was in October 1844 when Jesus left the holy place, went into the most holy place to, for, for, the, for the final time to intercede on behalf of those who have accepted him. So if it is that long, imagine how many years have gone by now. Does God need that much long time to judge the world? He could judge the world within a wink of an eye. That's great and powerful he is. But he is taking his time so that you and I would not be lost. That's an opportunity for you and for me. So it began long time ago. What does it say called saying? Cleansing of the sanctuary. If you are a student of the sanctuary studies, there's, holy, there's courtyard, there's holy place, there's most holy place, isn't it? What happens every day in the courtyard? People would bring their offerings, sacrifices, they are sacrificed, the blood is taken, gone into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil, which is a symbol that the sins are transferred from you to the lamb, from the lamb to the blood of the lamb and the lamb from the blood into the holy place. This happens every day, morning and evening. So throughout the year, the sanctuary have been, uh, uh, been accumulating the sins of his people. So once a year, they have to cleanse the sanctuary by, by, cleanse the sanctuary by taking the sins from the holy place to the most holy place. That's what we call the day of atonement. You remember that, isn't it? At one time when the things are cleansed, the sanctuary is cleansed and there is a fresh start again. So that's what is happening right now in the heavenly court. Day of atonement, people had their last chance to repent before facing judgment. On the day of atonement, still today when people, people who believe in this, they say, may you be sealed in the book of life forever. That's how they end it. The question is, when are we going to receive the rewards? You know, Bible speaks, look at Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Let me clarify here. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is not a reward for your good deeds. We are not saved by good deeds. But rewards are a separate entity that God is going to give when? According to the words of Jesus, when the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his, and then he shall reward you, which I will share in detail maybe tomorrow. Beginning of judgment, it begins with the dead according to scriptures, and I saw the dead, small, great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Beginning of judgment, it begins with the dead. Let me ask you, if it begins with the dead, whose name will come first? Who do you think? Huh? Adam, Eve? Abel, that he was the first and uh, believer in Christ. And also among the dead, it, Peter also tells us that the judgment must begin with who? With the house of God. Now, beginning of the judgment, it begins with the house of God. Look at that. For the time is come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? So if it begins with God's people, the righteous, and among them it begins with the dead, and among them it begins with the house of God. I believe, you believe, Adventist church is the house of God. If it is so, then it begins with you and me. And sometimes I wonder, does it begin alphabetically or chronologically? I want to thank God. I believe it, it, it does chronologically, not alphabetically. You know, my surname is Abba Dasari, A-B-B. Otherwise, my name would be first. I don't want it to be in the first list. Look at what Ellen White says. Beginning with those who lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation. It begins with our first lived people and comes one by one up to the ending with the living. The question is, how many people have to appear in judgment? 
what does the scripture say? Second Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, the, to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. How many have to appear? Each one of us. Each one of us. Romans 4, 14.10, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. So what is brought into judgment? What do you think will come up in the judgment? Ecclesiastes 11.9, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the day of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou, for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Solomon is saying, you young people, do whatever you want. You think that's your life, do it. But don't forget one thing. You have to give an account of everything you do. What does he say? All these things God will bring to judgment. So what is brought into judgment? Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. We all read it. Whatever is done in the body, whether good or bad, is brought into judgment. Ecclesiastes 12.14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every what? With every what? Secret thing. Whether it is good or whether it is evil. It is shocking. If there's a prophet here today, if there's a prophet here today, standing behind this pulpit, who can read our life and point a finger and say, what all you have done, all of us will run from this church. Certain things that you do, you know. What do you do when nobody is watching you? What are you watching on internet? What are you chatting when nobody is around you? Let me tell you, everything. What does the wise man say? Every secret thing. I, have I might have blinded your eyes. I might have blinded my wife's eyes, my kid's eyes, my church members. But I cannot escape the day of judgment. What comes? Every secret. All my life, nobody knew that secret. Not even my wife, whom I have lived for 24 years so far. But on the judgment day, it will come out. It will come out. So don't think that you're so smart that you're able to keep secrets nobody knows and pretend as though everything is okay with you. You can fool me, I can fool you, but not God. Keep that thought in mind. Keep that thought in mind. It, Solomon says, every secret thing, whether good or bad, is going to come to light someday. What else? Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account, therefore, in the day of judgment. What are idle words? What are idle words? Whenever you speak to somebody, words that doesn't bring blessing, words that doesn't uplift one another, words that doesn't encourage one another, words that have no meaning for whatsoever about who you are, what you do, must not be spoken. God has given us two ears, one mouth, so that we could listen more and speak less. In fact, Paul says, those who teach and preach, God will hold them more accountable because we speak a lot. What is necessary? Stick to that point. Don't speak. You know, when three people, when two people are standing and talking, most of the time the conversation is about a third person. Have you realized that? Listen, if two of you are talking, most of the time, the conversation about the third party. A little conversation goes between you and me. Oh, how are you? How is life? And after that, we go on doing all sorts of things. If it is not necessary, don't converse with that. Because the scripture says, every idle word. Idle words are those that doesn't benefit you, that doesn't benefit anyone. Don't speak, it says. That will come to judgment. Look at the next verse. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. 1 Peter 1.17, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself through the time of your stay here in fear. What is brought into judgment? Revelation 20.12, and I saw the dead, small, great standing before God. Books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. Every work we do will come to light. Now, if faith and works, let me just clarify a little bit here. 
How can God judge, justly judge us on the basis of our works when we aren't saved by works, but rather we are saved by grace through faith? Salvation is by faith, isn't it? Through the grace of God. And it has not, works have nothing to do. So if I'm not saved by works, if I'm saved by grace through faith, what is the point of bringing the works into judgment? Remember this. The judgment of God is not about who is going to be saved, who is going to be God. It's not about that. It's about to clarify to the world who have accepted Christ or not. For example, faith. Why can't he judge me by my faith? You know the postmodern mindset? Religion is personal. You keep your religion, I keep my religion. I don't have to tell you my faith, you don't have to tell me my faith. This is how in the West people speak. It's a personal thing. I don't have to prove to you anything. But that's not what Christianity is all about. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Jesus also said, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Did it say faith? What does it say? That they may see your good works, which is the result of your faith, and then they'll glorify God. You cannot separate faith and good works. The evidence of your faith is the works. You're not saved by works, but the evidence of your faith is seen in the works. So, our works reveal the quality of faith we have in Christ Jesus. Faith is inward. You can't show your faith own except by your works. So, judgment is not, is not for God's information, but to inform his created beings who don't have everything for, and uh, can't read thoughts. For example, if you go to a courtroom and you have to produce a witness, and if the witness is invisible, what will the lawyer or judge will say? They don't know, isn't it? Faith is invisible. You can't show it apart from works. So in the same way, if an exhibit, a piece of evidence that the jury can't see, how can they judge on that one? So you have to produce an evidence that is visible, that is tangible of what has happened. So the evidence of your faith is the works. As much as I'm not saved by works, I've saved by faith, but the evidence of my salvation is the works that prove that I am a saved person. So the final judgment produced by the, for the benefit of the inhabitants of the universe must present evidence that they can see. The whole world is watching to see how can Mohan be saved? What is evidence there of my faith? The evidence is my work. And by the way, can I look at the tooth? Uh, so when it comes to works, even the good I do, I don't do it with my strength. God who enables me. When I repent of my sins, it's not my work. It's the Holy Spirit that makes me repent. So the good I do, the repentance I come, the obedience I show is not my initiation. It is God who does those things in me. So that's why there's nothing to boast about me. If you're feeling guilty, I shouldn't have done it, and your mind is bothering, you know what? That's not your work. It's the Holy Spirit's work. If you feel like helping somebody because you are moved by what you saw, that's not your work. It's the Holy Spirit telling you, show some kindness there. So there's nothing to boast about because Isaiah says, all that of man's righteousness is like what? Fill the rags. So if there's some good in you, it is not your initiation. It is the Spirit of God working in and through you. So who should get the credit then? I baptize these many people. My dear pastors, we only baptize physically. Conversion comes from God. Never take the credit for yourself what the Holy Spirit has worked in somebody's life. Don't keep a record of how many people you baptized and think that you have done well. It is going to go against you in the judgment day. Everything you do, give credit to God, not to yourself. Because on your own strength, we are not. You know what the Bible says? Man's heart is what? Desperately wicked. There's no good in us. Every little good that comes out of you is the work of God and not you. That's where there's nothing to boast about. Keep that thought in mind. So faith, we are, we are, as much as we are saved by faith, our works are the evidence of the faith we have in Christ. There are two facts in the judgment in the last days. 
There are two things are possible. But these two things are possible on this earth. They are not possible in the heavenly judgment. Romans 2, 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment. What does it mean? No one can escape the heavenly judgment. Is it possible to commit a crime on this earth and escape the judgment? Yes or no? Yeah, if you have money, if you have influence, you don't even have to go to court, isn't it? That's possible. You can commit the highest crime on this earth and still escape the judgment. But you cannot escape the heavenly judgment. Don't think you're too smart, you can. What's the second thing? What's the second thing? Look at what Moses is saying. God is saying through Moses, you shall not respect persons in judgment. Okay? By, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. For the judgment is God's and the cause that is too hard for you. Bring it to me and I will hear it. Deuteronomy 16, 19 says, Thou shall not rest judgment. Thou shall not respect persons. Neither take a gift nor a gift doeth blind the eyes. For a gift blindeth the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So what's the point? There is no partiality in the heavenly judgment. Can you see partiality on the earthly judgment? Yes or no? Sometimes it's the innocent that gets punished. It's the criminal that gets released. Have you seen that happening? So many cases I've known, I've seen. But in the heavenly judgment, through God through Moses has revealed there's no partiality. If you're poor or wretched or whoever, or if you're a president or a prime minister or even a pastor, everybody will be treated equal. There's no partiality. The hierarchy is a problem to you and me, not to God. We give that credit to ourselves, but God treats everyone else. As much as he loves me, he loves you. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean God has a special favor for me, no. Each one of us, because in the New Testament, we believe in the priesthood of what? All believers. There's no hierarchy. I am a priest, you are a priest unto the Lord. But we have brought that division ourselves. But God says there is no partiality in the heavenly judgment. Where does the judgment take place? You, you know that Daniel 7, 9, And I behold the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garments was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10, A fiery stream ensued and came from before him and thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judgment was set and the books were opened where does it who is the ancient of days where and where does the ancient of days sit ancient of days is referring to god the father where does he sit in heaven look at jesus taught us to pray our father who is in heaven that's the ancient of days and how can judgment take place in heaven when i'm here on earth for example, in the earthly uh, court scene, you have to present yourself before the judge, isn't it? You can't be judged without your presence there. Or if, but how is it? The judgment is right now happening in heaven. I don't know when your name, my name would come. I'm still here. How can I be judged in heaven when I'm still on this earth? How will I be present in heaven when I'm here? Or how can the dead be present in heaven? For example, the judgment begins with the dead. For example, take the name of uh, Abel, who is the first dead. His name comes up. How can he be judged when he's, where is Abel now? Is he in heaven? We all know as Adventists, the dead go nowhere, isn't it? Yeah, so how can God judge him without hearing from him when he's dead and buried and we don't even know where it is? How is it possible? What happened to Adam when he died, for example? What happened to Adam when he died? At death, his body returned to the dust. That's what the scripture says, isn't it? When he died, his body returned. What happened to his spirit? Ecclesiastes tell us that the spirit returns to God. Body is made up of two. When God created Adam and Eve, he brought two elements together. The dust of the ground and the breath of life. Brought together and then the scripture says, man became a living soul. And what happens at death? Those two things are separated. The dust which is from the ground is going back to the ground. The breath of life which is the spirit of God goes back to the one who gave it the scripture says. When it says the spirit goes back to the one God, God doesn't mean there is some kind of a spirit which is going to heaven. That's not what we believe. If you are a student of scriptures, you realize spirit has different meanings which I will share a little bit here. So for example, how, how long did Adam live? 930 years. 
oh, what happened to 930 years of Adam's life? Is it just wiped away? The dust has, body has become dust, the spirit has gone. So what about his life then? 930 years of his life, what happened? All through the life of Adam, God was keeping an exact copy of him in the written form. Each one of us have a written form in heaven. Every detail of Adam's life was recorded in heaven and he lived and when he died, God closed his book. What that means, in other words, Adam physically died but lived on in heaven through what? Through the records of his life. Two Adams. One is personal Adam, dead and buried. There is the copy of Adam in heaven in the form of a record. Everything. That, isn't that what we see? For example, where is Jesus now? Where is he now? He is in heaven. He has gone to heaven after the resurrection. Now, but he is on earth also right now. Where? Through his spirit and through his word. We feel God's presence through the, his spirit and through his word. In the same way, we are personally here on earth right now. But there is a record of Mohan in heaven, which is being kept of everything that I do. So the books in heaven will contain our thoughts, our words, our actions. So when your name and my name comes up, I don't have to be physically present there because everything of who I am, what I have done is evidently recorded and kept. Ellen White says, our characters are recorded in the books of heaven as our faces on photo plates here. So our character photos are in heaven and by these records we shall be judged. You know, during the time of Ellen White, the photography was just developing. One of the things that they could understand is how the exact copy of who you are can only be explained through a photocopy or a photo plate, those days they call it. For example, when you take a photo of me, what happens? You can see this one. If there's a mark or some scratch or some dirt here, what will the camera do? Do you think it will remove? No, it just takes as I am. So Ellen White's time, the photo plates were a common thing of uh, trying to understand how a copy of something looks like. So she says, our characters are recorded in the heavenly books just like the photo plates here. So our characters are like photos in heaven. God speaks to lang humans in the language of the day, isn't it? That, that language of what Ellen White was revealed may not make sense to us because nowadays you don't see any photo plates. You can take a picture and see immediately. My childhood, you take a photo, it has to go to the uh, studios, they have to, whatever they have to do it and it has come back to you. Whether you smiled or not, nothing knows until you see the photo. That's the development we have in today's cameras. You can edit, you can take out the dirt, you can put on, if you're dark, you can make it fair, all sorts of things we do. But God speaks to the language of those days. For example, Daniel, when God spoke to Daniel, he spoke about what? The kingdoms, the beasts and all. Because that is common thing for people around that to understand. Had God spoken to Daniel about the language of pen drives and CDs and internet and all, would you think he would have understood? No. God is such a merciful God. He comes down to the level of humanity to make us understand. But we need to translate into the language we understand. So the Bible says the spirit returns to God. What is it then? What is the spirit that returns to God? Is it any part of your body? Is it the air that you think or the oxygen that you breathe in? What is it? The spirit that returns to God at death is not only the breath, because that's what stops us from living, but it is your personal identity. Your spirit becomes personalized. Mohan's identity is preserved for eternity. Get this statement, please. Mohan's identity is preserved for how long? For eternity. Look at what our Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1093 says. Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection. The spirit, the character of man is returned to God, there to be preserved. So when the Bible says, the spirit returns to the God who gave it, it is, it is saying, your character, your life is returning to God who gave it to you. And it is preserved in heaven in the form of a recorded book. Every detail of you is recorded. Nothing of you is lost. That's what we call the spirit returning to God who gave it. Heavenly court scene. How does the... Have anybody have been to an earthly court? Anybody have gone into earthly court from here? You all are saints, huh? I've been many times, for not the crimes I made, but to represent my members. I've seen, I'm sure you at least have seen in the movies or in the TV, 
Do you need a, you see the arrangement? There is the throne, the main judge sits, isn't it? And then before him is the jury. I mean, I mean the, the, the secretaries or clerks, whoever, with all the books and records. You see a bone on the left and on the right. One is the witness. Have you seen? And you see a jury sitting in the front. And there's witnesses everywhere and people who wants to see. I'm so amazed to know even the heavenly scene is in the exact same order. I don't know if that they copied it from Bible and arranged it in that way. Look at what Daniel 9, 10 says. And I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days were seated, the judge. His garments and experience. And after that it says, a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Angels, witnesses. And what else it says? And the books were opened. Before the judge are the books opened. On looking universe watching gods execute the judgment that leads to the establishment of his eternal thing. Judgment scene, that's how it looks. Who is the lawyer in the judgment? Or your pleader, whatever you call it. The scripture says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have a who? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, our righteous. He is going to represent you. Now the first aspect of the judgment, the Bible says the books were opened. It doesn't say book, it says what? Books. Books means it's more than one. Let's quickly look at how many books are there in heaven. Daniel 7, 9 to 10, the books were opened and I saw them open the book of life, it says, isn't it? So book of life. Now the question is, whose names are written in the book of life? Look at Revelation 3, 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So whose names are written in the book of life? The names of those who overcome sin. Are you in that category? What else? Luke 10, 20 says, Notwithstanding in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Who is he talking about this here? The disciples came to Jesus and said, Oh, in your name we cast away devils. They were excited. Jesus says, that's not more important. I want you to rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. So the disciples are who? The followers of Jesus. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 4.3. And I entreat thee also, true your fellow, help these women, which is labored with thee in the gospel, with Clement also and with others, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Are you getting my point? Whose names are in the book of life? The fellow laborers. Look at what God says, Moses. Moses talking to God, he says, Not yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. If not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses' name was in the book of life. So whose names are written in the book of life? This is the criteria. All those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior, their names are in the book of life. I can raise my hand and say, my name is in the book of life. If there's anyone here who has not yet given your life to the Lord through baptism, accepted, confessed him publicly, your name is yet to be written in the book of life and it is in your hand, nobody's hand. So remember this criteria. Whose names will be in the book of life? If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. The book of life contains, look at what Ellen White says, Great Controversy 480. The book of life contains the names of all who have ever entered into the service of God. Where should your name be in order to get into heaven? Look at Revelation 21, 27. But there shall be by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. If your name is not in the book of life, you are not guaranteed a place in that eternal home. So who can escape the great time of trouble in the last days? Daniel 12, 1 says, whose names are in the book of God. So you see how important that your name is written in the book of life. The second book, look at Malachi 3.16, and they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of what? Book of what? Book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So there's a book called Book of Remembrance. Look at Ma Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and they shall reward every man according to his work. So the second book is the book of remembrance. The, the what is written there according to Malachi 3, 16? All the good deeds. The good deeds of his people are written in the book of remembrance. 
like, like the examples of Esther during the time. And then Nehemiah says, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its service. In other words, look at, let me read this statement, it would make you more clear. What Ellen White says about the book of remembrance. In the book of God's remembrance, listen to this, every deed of righteousness is immortalized. There every temptation resisted, every evil overcome, Every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled. Every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded. What does the book of remembrance contain? Every good deed you did is recorded because when we get to heaven, God is going to reward us for everything. God is not going to forget. I may forget, you may forget. That's why if you have resisted a temptation, that's a good thing, all those things. Uh, God is going to keep. So that's the second book. What do you think is the third book? Isaiah says, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord. Isaiah is saying, All our iniquities are recorded in the presence of God. And Jeremiah says, For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is what? Marked before me. That means it's written before me. The Bible doesn't exactly directly give us the name of the book, but the Adventist scholars and the church gave the name to this book as the book of iniquity or the book of death. What is written in this book? Look at what Ellen White says. There is a record also of the sins of men, the secret purposes and motives appear in an unerring register. This is shocking. In Christianity, what matters is your motive. Even if you do a good deed with the wrong motive, it goes into the book of death. Do you know that? Even if you do a good deed with the wrong motive, it is a wrong deed. She says, every wrong. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is written with terrible exactness. Every wrong word you spoke, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty might be a people. That's why I said, don't be lazy. If, if your work is from 8 to 9, give your faithful attention to that. Do your best. Like I said yesterday, walk that second mile. Because the scripture says, every unfulfilled duty is written in the book against you. You can fool me, I can fool you, but not the heavenly records. And every secret sin that my wife doesn't know, my children doesn't know, my church doesn't know, is clearly recorded. With every artful dissembling, heaven sent warnings and reproofs neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities. God gives us opportunity day after day. If you have not appreciated and just ignored them, that will go against you. The influence exerted for good or for evil with its far-reaching results. Some of us are an influence for good or for bad. That will go against us. Are all chronicled in the record of heaven. And that's why we need to intentionally live. How much of ink and paper is needed to write everything about you? Your secrets, your words, your deeds from the time you get. For example, from the morning you got up till the night you sleep, everything is recorded. Your thoughts, your motives, your intentions, your actions, your walks, your what? How much time, how many pages it will take to write one day's history? So much, isn't it? I used to wonder, what kind of a book is there in heaven? That and I'm 46 years old now. For the last 46 years of my life, every day, how many pages, what kind of a thick book that would be? But today I realize how foolish of me to think like that. Because in a pen drive so small, nowadays you have 16 GB, 32 GB, 64 GB, 128, 256, 1 TB, 2 TB, isn't it? How many books in the, th in the 16 GB pen drive you can put Thousands and thousands and thousands of books. If man can compress that much information into a small thing, what can God do? Who can limit God's knowledge and wisdom, isn't it? The word book is used so that at that time, for that people, book was the only way of looking at records. But when we get to heaven, I don't, I don't think of seeing a book, but something technology that no human being could have even invented. I'm going to watch it and see. 
So that's what it means. So what is the standard of judgment? Fear God and keep his what? Commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. So what is the standard? Alan White says the law of God is the standard by which the character and the lives of men will be tested in the judgment. What is it? The law of God is a standard from which you will be and I will be judged. So for our information, I want to illustrate something here. Book of life, help me out here. Whose names will be in the book of life? Quickly. Whose names? Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their savior. Whose names will be in the book of remembrance? I need help. Those who have done good deeds. Whose names will be in the book of death? All those who have sinned. Isn't it? So let's take a few names and see if we can get this clearly. The name Adam, the first man. Will, his, will the name of Adam be in the book of life? Yes or no? Yes. Did he accept Jesus as his savior? Yes. Will his name be in the book of remembrance? What good did he do? It's because of him I'm short today. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> what good did he do? Had he not eaten that fruit, listened to his wife, I will be as tall as some of you guys. Did Adam do anything good? There is something that Adam did. If he didn't do it, this world would be a chaos. Can you name what it is? He was the one who gave the names to the creation of God. If you have a name today, if I had a name today, it's because of Adam. You remember? He said, this is elephant, that is mango tree, this is Eve, this is this, this is that. God gave him that gift to do it. Imagine we don't have names today. How would you call each other? How would you call each other? Oh, that black man, oh, short man, oh, this man, oh, bald man, I don't know. Oh, fat woman, I don't know what all we call ourselves. Praise God for the good he did. He taught his children the value of life. So, will his name be in the book of life? Will his name be in the book of death? You're already judging, huh? Did he sin? Don't judge. Just meet the criteria. Did Adam sin? Then where his name should be then? Will his name be in the book of death? Confused. Whose names will get into the book of death? All those who have sinned. So will his name be in the book of death? Yes. yes, don't get confused. You're not judges, okay? Don't judge whether his name will be there. You just meet the criteria. Don't become judges immediately. Let's take the name of King David. Will his name be in the book of life? Will his name be in the book of remembrance? What good did he do? Every time you think of David, Bathsheba comes, yeah? What good did he do? Won the battles for God, isn't it? At least all of us, the famous story of David and Goliath is a good thing. Will David's name be in the book of death? Did he sin? And now you're getting it, good. Let's take the name of King Saul. Will King Saul's name be in the book of life? Hmm. Will his name be in the book of life? Yes or no? I'm hearing no's, I'm hearing yes. Did he accept and believe in Jesus? Yes, don't judge. Remember that you're not the judges. We know that. He, in fact, you know what the Bible says about Saul? The spirit of the Lord was on him. He was like one of the prophets, isn't it? God spoke through him. He knew God. So his name will be in the book of life. Will his name be in the book of remembrance? Yes. What good did he do? Did he do any good? Yes, yes he fought the battles for God. Will his name be in the book of death? Yes, yes or no? That is your getting it clear now, huh? Okay, let's take another name. Apostle Peter. Will his name be in the book of life? Yes or no? Will his name be in the book of remembrance? What good did he do? Yeah. Will his name be in the book of death? Did he sin? Let's take another disciple, famous one, Judas Iscariot. Will his name be in the book of life? You're sure? You're sure? Yes. Wonderful. Did he accept Jesus? Yes, he's a, one of the disciples. Will his name be in the book of remembrance? Yes. Why? He was a thief. Every money that came half went into his pocket. 
In the Adventist church, we have so many thieves. We have so many thieves. In every institution, in every church, I'm not apologetic in saying this. Lord, have mercy on us. People who steal offering, Lord, have mercy on us. People who don't put offering is also a thief because the scripture says you're robbing God. A robber is called a thief. Be, be, be careful, be serious about what God says. So Judas, did he do anything good? Yes or no? Yes, he, he, mirac he did miracles, he served the Lord. Will his name be in the book of um, death? <clears throat> Last name. Last name. Will Mohan's name be in the book of life? You know who Mohan is? Yes. Will his name be in the book of life? Yes. Thank you, you have that uh, confidence. Will Mohan's name be in the book of remembrance? Yes. What good did he do? I came all the way from England to preach to you. It's a good thing. Will Mohan's name be in the book of death? Yes. <laughs> How come you're saying it with so much conviction, that part of it? You don't know my sins, I've never sinned. How can you say my name is in the book of death? Well, I just said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, yeah? Yes. This is how the records in heaven are contained. Remember, we are doing the first phase of judgment. This has only to do with who? God's people, not the wicked and anybody else. When all the names are like this, what is going to have happen then? Either your name should be in the book of life or book of death. It can't be in both places, isn't it? That's what is going to be the judgment, which I will share with you tomorrow. What does a just judgment accomplish? Tomorrow will be an amazing study, and I pray that you all will come to learn what happens to your name, what happens to my name. Will it be retained in the book of life, or will it be in both places? If not, how does it work? But I want to give an appeal just to you, as you think and contemplate. If your name is not written in the book of life, you will not be a part of the first phase of judgment. You have an opportunity to let your name come in the book of life. As baptisms are being planned, if you have not given your life, or you want to recommit your life because you have gone too far away from God, talk to your pastor, talk to your church here, and make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Tomorrow we will see how the judgment actually takes place in heaven. God bless you.